come to Christ Church Cathedral Grafton and this service of Holy Communion from a prayer book for Australia, which is printed in the bulletin booklet. We invite you to keep safe distance from others and join in the spirit of worship as the choir sings for us. The cathedral stands on the traditional lands of the Bundjalung nation. We acknowledge and pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and to people with indigenous heritage with us today. We seek the peace and well-being of our nation, and especially our local community. We continue our worship as the choir sings the processional hymn from Together in Song, as a chalice cast of gold. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's, God's kingdom, kingdom, now, now and, and forever. forever. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, Hence the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting them to the Lord's table. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful God, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gracious God, we who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death. We pray that as you raised him from death, so by the power of the Holy Spirit we may live the new life to your glory, knowing ourselves to be dead in sin, but alive for you, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the ministry of the word. The first reading, Genesis 21, verses 18 to 21. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. She said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit 
along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you to. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Bathsheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Do not let me look on the death of that child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with a bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house feasible, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, Proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground unperceived by your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Please be seated. It's not quite back to the point where I don't have to stand and juggle the iPad as well as remembering where I'm up to. Sometimes the lectionary, which is our set of readings, of course, are shared amongst all the major church families. Sometimes um, in the readings we have for the lectionary, we're offered biblical texts which welcome us in to a space where we can explore and celebrate that sacred love which is at the heart of the universe, the God that we know in Jesus. But this is not one of those days. Both the readings were pretty edgy at times. Other times the Bible invites us to struggle with the sacred text, like Jacob in that ancient story from Genesis where he wrestles with this figure this angel all night, and then discovers he's been wrestling with God. And that's the kind of Sunday I think we have today. And there are ways for the preacher to avoid the struggle. One is to have a guest preacher. The other would be to dive into Romans 6, which we didn't read, and and talk and, and tease out some of Paul's complex theology of baptism. Probably better done in a Bible study group than in a sermon. What I felt, what I felt drawn to this week as I was getting ready for the sermon, was the figure of Hagar. She was a black slave, owned by Sarah and Abraham, and used by them as a surrogate mother to provide them with a child, so that their dreams of a future could be secured at the cost of her present 
suffering. As I look for some kind of graphic to put on the front page of the bulletin, since we're putting them online for people to download, I was particularly attracted to that image that you'll see on the front page of the bulletin today. When I say attracted, it caught my eye and I couldn't, I couldn't choose any of the other images, and there were hundreds of them, but this image jumped out for me. It's a haunting image of a young woman who's obviously a mother. She doesn't look to be in good economic and social situation. Her child looks distressed, possibly living in or just thrown out from a not very fancy caravan in a pretty isolated and remote location and a car possibly disappearing in the distance, which is where her eyes are looking in the image. And of course, it's all in grey tones. There's no colour. It's sombre. It's possibly sad. But having seen that image, I knew I had to talk about Hagar this morning. So, here we go. So we look at that young woman and her child, and I've just given you my, my interpretation of that image. And as we do that, let's hear again the harsh words of Sarah, the woman of privilege. Her name means princess um, in Hebrew. So let's hear again the words of Sarah. Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this, this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son, Isaac. So there's a question for the women with us today. Would you choose to be in the position of the young woman? For the men here today, how well do we stand by the women that we love? And for all of us, when we see the face of our children and our grandchildren in the child in that photograph, As the Bible tells the story of Hagar, she was a young Egyptian woman who'd become a slave within the household of Abraham and Sarah. We're not told how that happened, but just that she turns up in the story as part of their extended household. She's a slave. And we know that the biblical world was a world where slavery was normal. And it could either, you could either be a lucky slave or an unlucky slave, but a whole lot of people were slaves. It was one of the ways in which you survived. But the idea that Abraham and Sarah had slaves kind of grates a little bit, I suspect, on our conscience. It's not really okay by us anymore that people like Abraham and Sarah owned, thought they could own other people. And yet the text doesn't challenge that. And that's one of the things, one of the ways we might find ourselves struggling with the text. Is God really happy with slavery? Because we're not. And then there's the irony of a Hebrew family with an Egyptian slave. I mean, that's kind of turning the story upside down. We know that the descendants of Abraham going to end up being slaves in Egypt and eventually be rescued and so on. So there's a quirky kind of irony in the story. And in a way, you could, you could imagine why Jewish people later on would enjoy telling that story. Well, actually, you know, in the olden days, Abraham and Sarah, they had Egyptians for slaves. Okay, You can see why that story would kind of hang around. I guess what it says to us is that life is complicated. Truth is twisted and justice is crooked. As we know from African slavery in the United States and indigenous slavery in our own land, female slaves are often sexually abused by their owners. And every time I say the word owner, please imagine inverted commas around that word. People who presume to think that they can possess another human being. And it wasn't just the women. 
The boys and the young men were also abused by their privileged owners as well. So Hagar is given a task to fulfill by her mistress, by her owner, Sarah, princess. Go and have sex with the old man, my husband, Abraham, and get yourself pregnant. Now, that's not normally the kind of instruction we would expect perhaps to be given. But it was a different world. But, but notice what's going on here. The baby you will conceive, because you're going to keep doing this until the old fella gets you pregnant, the baby you will conceive won't be yours. That kid will belong to me because I'm Sarah. I'm the princess. Your child will be my child because I can't have one of my own. That's a pretty heavy power game being laid on her. I'm your mistress. I'm your owner. You're nothing. You're just a baby machine. Do as I say. Along with the promise, of course, if you do what I say, we will look after you. How often have people heard a false promise like that? As I mentioned at the beginning, Hagar was almost certainly black, as most Egyptians tend to be compared with folk in Canaan and Palestine. So it's clear from the story, as we've also seen more recently, and I guess the recent Black Lives controversy is why this story jumped out at me. I couldn't just push it aside and talk about the gospel. It's clear, then as now, black lives don't matter, at least not as much as our, our lives do, and not as much as they should in the eyes of people of privilege. And all of this is in the Bible, and it all passes without any censure, without any critical comment by the editor. But of course, it doesn't end with the enslavement and the sexual abuse of a young woman of color from Egypt. Because as it turns out in the story, not very long afterwards, a few years later, the mistress, the woman of privilege, has a child of her own. And then, both the slave girl and her child are expendable. Worse than that, they're a threat to the privilege of the owner and her new child. They need to go. They need to be got rid of. Where? Who cares? Just get them both out of here. I don't want to see either of them ever again. And all this venom from a woman who had already claimed that child as her own and was legally the mother of Ishmael. Abraham, of course, is no paragon of male leadership and virtue in this, in this story, even though the Bible excuses his lack of compassion and even shifts the blame across to God. But then how many times have we seen racists claim divine sanction for their hatred? How many times do people of privilege claim that their power over others is the way it should be? It's a gift from God. It's not something they've sought to attain for themselves. So this is a classic example of what Phyllis Tribble, um, a biblical scholar when I was a student, called texts of terror. And they're mostly terrible texts because they involve violence against women and they pass unchallenged most times or we just leave them out of the lectionary because we don't know what to do with them. So the question for me is, in the corner of this text of terror, can we find a small scrap of good news? As we heard, both Hagar and her son Ishmael survive their expulsion because God intervenes to save them. The child grows up, his mother finds him a wife from Egypt, again another interesting twist, and in the tradition, Ishmael becomes the ancestor of the Arabs. Okay, so, okay, he did. turned out happily ever after, maybe. But God mostly does not intervene to rescue people when they're abused and exploited. Most of the time, injustice is neither addressed or redressed. It just happens. So as Jesus' people, 
Where do we find good news? Where do we find healing? Where do we find salvation in such a terrible tale? And as we wrestle with scripture, what news of freedom and liberation and hope do we find in a story like this? How long has Hagar had to wait for the crimes against her to be recognized? And not just Hagar the Egyptian, but all the black women and all the black boys who have been abused and exploited by people of privilege in our culture and in other cultures, in our society, and even in our religion. Justice for Hagar comes when we see that what happened to her is not okay. Redemption for Hagar and her child comes when our hearts break at their treatment, when we sit opposite the child and weep and raise our lament to heaven. Restoration comes when we honour Hagar as a great woman in the story of faith. And good news is found when we stand with Jesus and proclaim the words of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Amen. stand. Let us together affirm the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the world and for the church. O oh God, you have embraced our lives and our deaths through the incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that we may walk in newness of life as we pray for the needs of the world. We pray for Murray, our Bishop, and all the congregations across our diocese as we seek to regather and rebuild during this time of pandemic. Empower your church that all who are baptised into the death of Christ may be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Lord, hear us. 
Lord, Lord, hear hear our our prayer. We pray for our world, especially those places where the COVID-19 virus seems to run unchecked. May the resurrection life of Jesus renew the face of the earth in every nation, that you may deliver the lives of the needy from all who wish them harm. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. (coughs) We pray for the disinherited, dispossessed and refugees, those who are cast out and oppressed, those who suffer jealousy and prejudice, mothers and children who are helpless and hopeless in the face of domestic abuse and violence. Enfold them and, as you care for for the fall of the sparrow, keep watch over the lives of your children and rescue the suffering. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all who live and work in this city of Grafton and the Clarence Valley. May your vibrant presence in the natural world gladden all in our community and inspire us to to the challenge of faithfully living in Christ. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick, especially Sue Cotter, Betty Ford, Brian Holly, Robert Lindley, Joan Ma, and Val Rogers. Let your resurrection life bring healing and wholeness to all for whom we offer our prayers. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. We remember those who have died in Christ, especially Pat Ardron, Fran Shepherd, and also Charles Moulds, Jason Wilkes, and Val Ensby, whose years mind we remember this week. Rest eternal grant to them, O Lord, and and let let light perpetual shine shine upon them. Now if you could please join me as we say the cathedral prayer together. Living and eternal eternal Christ, bless the ministry ministry of this cathedral. cathedral. As a place of pilgrimage and prayer. May our doors always be open to pilgrims. May our hearts always be open to one another. And may our minds always be open to new truth. Draw us deeply into the mystery of your life, your death, and your resurrection, now and always. Amen. Please stand for the greeting of peace. We are the body of Christ. His spirit is with us. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. And just offer a sign of peace quietly and safely to each other. And after the peace, I invite you to please sit quietly while I prepare the table and reflect on those you would like to pray for and prepare yourselves for the Eucharist.
please stand. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed, Blessed be God, God forever. forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share, accept and use our offerings for the glory of your people and the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Right to give our thanks and praise. All glory and honor be yours always and everywhere. Mighty Creator, ever living God. We give you thanks and praise for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ who by the power of your spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, for ever praising you and singing. Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and again giving you thanks. He gave it to his disciples saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shared for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself, made once for all upon the cross. This mighty resurrection and glorious ascension and looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit. Unite us in the body of your Son and bring us with all your people 
into the joy of your eternal kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power are yours forever and ever. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As this broken bread was once many grains which have been gathered together and made one bread, so may your church be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. <coughs> gifts of God for the people of God, holy things for holy people, broken things for broken people.
welcome back to the choir. It's great to have the larger group here with us and to see you all togged up and looking angelic once again. So, uh, and of course, the music is beautiful as well. So, great to have most of you back today. Uh, a reminder for folk, we are open for services. We have, we have to operate within various uh, uh, sort of terms and uh, constraints as part of the uh, existing public health order. The most important thing is that we have to clean the cathedral before and after every service and restrict the numbers and track uh, the details of people that are here just in case there were an infection and then we're able to let everybody know that they need to go and have some tests. So uh, it's good to see the numbers slowly building up and uh, it's great that people can continue to join us online as well. Uh, the new cameras are in. The sound system is pretty well completed. We've just, uh, we, as in Grant, is now just trying to get them to play nicely and uh, all integrate in just the right way down to the last sort of millisecond. So hopefully by next Sunday, uh, we won't have our little skinny black friend standing here in the middle of the cathedral. Have a couple of birthdays coming up this week as well. So birthdays this week for Margaret Costello, and also Moya Cooksley. So if you see them during the week, please give them uh, the love and uh, care and greetings from their cathedral community. Uh, there's a program that's been advertised. You may have seen the advertising as I have also, just in the last day or so. Four Corners is doing a special program tomorrow night on the, uh, um, on the Anglicare home in Sydney, which was at the center of one of the worst outbreaks of the uh, COVID. 19 infection. Um, that may cause some concern for people, um, and at one level it should cause concern for people, of course. Um, but it, it's also important that we, we support everybody involved in that story, the staff at the Anglicare home, the Anglicare leadership in Sydney, bearing in mind, of course, that Anglicare North Coast and Anglicare Adelaide or Brisbane or whatever are actually quite separate organisations, but nonetheless, people will join the dots and I think this is reflecting badly everywhere. Um, so let's keep all those who might be affected, and especially the, the, the um, people who have family members in, an, in, in that Anglicare home, and the staff and all those responsible for the operation of that, of that facility. Uh, as you know, the bookshop has been reopened for a couple of weeks now. The op shop is reopening tomorrow. For the, time, for the first couple of weeks, it won't be open on Wednesday but we're running 10 to 4 on the other four days a week. Um, and we're still um, so rebuilding the team and uh, getting ready to move on to what the op shop will become on the other side of the COVID pandemic. Um, and remember, it's really important, and a few more folk have done this this week, if you have email, if you have a mobile phone, please make sure we have those details in the parish office it is the best way to get information out quickly when there's a need to do that. The other thing, of course, which we will be using and keep going for the time being is um, different people on Parish Council, most members of Parish Council have a list of 20, 25 names of families, households, and we're phoning those places, those people every week or 10 days or so, and that also gives us a really good way to get information out to people quickly. Um, if by any chance you're not getting the phone call, it could be that we don't have you on the parish roll. Okay? People do fall between the cracks sometimes. So if you don't have somebody ringing you up and checking on you every 10 days or two weeks, just check in with Roger to make sure we do actually have you on the parish roll because we don't want to be overlooking anybody in that network of care. Of course, I was about to say, let's stand and sing our final hymn. Instead, I'm going to say, let's stand and enjoy our mission hymn, which will be sung for us by the choir.
living God, in this holy meal, you fill us with new hope. May the power of your love, which we have known in word and sacrament, continue your saving work among us. Give us courage for our pilgrimage and bring us to the joys you promise. Most loving God, you send Give us into the world you love. Give us grace to go thankfully and with courage in the power of your Spirit. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ.